My favorite thing about Summit is uh, those crazy pinch me is this really happening moments. Like I'm just about to introduce two of my heroes, uh, Harry Shearer and Greg Cott, and they are going to have a real live conversation right before your eyes. Um, I don't even know where to start with Harry Shearer. He's a musician, he's an actor, he's a champion of New Orleans music and culture and a ton more. Um, yeah, he is Derek Smalls, the legendary lukewarm water from Spinal Tap. Uh, he's also the voice of Principal Skinner and Reverend Lovejoy on The Simpsons. He was an early Saturday Night Live cast member and let's not forget A Mighty Wind, OMG, I believe as the kids say. Uh, currently he hosts a hilarious and insightful and always interesting radio show, Le Show, Le Show, on KCRW, which takes aim at the mega morons of the mighty media. And I, I think we're quite familiar uh, with them. Then there's his uh, new YouTube series called Nixon's The One, where he plays none other than America's 37th president, Richard Nixon. And um, you definitely should look that up. I, I watched a couple of excerpts, and they are hilarious. Um, Harry also directed the 2010 documentary, The Big Uneasy, about the impact of Hurricane Katrina on uh, that community. And that's something that a lot of our musician friends care deeply about, so we're incredibly supportive of the work that he did there and continues to do. And did I mention that he's also a musician and a, a passionate music advocate? So we're going to hear a ton more about that today. And then there's Greg Cott. This is uh, one of our favorite music critics in the history of the world, and he's also the guy that wrote the book on the changes that the music industry uh, is facing and the subjects that we love to talk about here at Summit. That book is called Ripped, and by the way, I've had it in my syllabus for years. Greg is the co-host of the mighty WBEZ radio show Sound Opinions, along with Jim DeRogatis. And I'd say that besides Harry's show, it's probably the best radio program in these United States. But hey, enough of my yakking. What do you say? Let's boogie. Thanks for uh, coming indoors on such a beautiful day. Uh, it's a real honor to have Harry here. Um, been a hero, personal hero of mine, uh, for various reasons. Um, I think also there's a there's a discussion to be had here about uh, you know in relationship to wh wh where does Harry fit in sort of a, in a music summit. Obviously, there is a musical aspect to his career, but there's so many other things that he's been involved in. And I think it's instructive uh, to talk to Harry uh, from a standpoint of uh, being a creative person, making a life out of being creative uh, in just about every medium you could think of. Uh, but I want to sort of, you know, rather than talk about sort of the macro picture, I want to, I want to talk about uh, an aspect of regionalism here. And it's come up a few times in this conference. Uh, we've seen some great presentations about Denver. Uh, we've seen some great presentations about what's happening in Austin over the last few years and, and at various points. Uh, we've seen some of the stuff that's going on in DC right here in our own backyard. Um, Harry is a, uh, a resident of New Orleans. Uh, there was a panel yesterday uh, that uh, was on this subject. Very some very important issues going on in New Orleans. Harry has been extremely active uh, on a local level, which I think, again, is an instructive uh, aspect of somebody's work in the art world to be regional, to be local, to be concerned about what's going on in your own backyard besides the bigger level of your career. So Harry, I think, I think it would be good to hear your take on, on what is going on in New Orleans post-Katrina, I think it may be surprising to some people who have not been there yeah, lately. Yeah, I think so. Uh, first of all, just to clarify, the documentary was not about uh, uh, anything to do with the results of Katrina. Uh, it was about the two independent university-based investigations into what really caused the flood in New Orleans, which was uh, serious misfeasance and malfeasance by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, not widely known in this country, still after I made the documentary. Anyway, um, New Orleans is a city that um, has a profound and unique uh, indigenous culture. Uh, it's a food culture, it's a music culture, it's an architectural culture, it's a wide-ranging culture, but music is certainly what I think most people know about New Orleans. Uh, it was widely predicted after the flood that uh, if New Orleans were to survive at all, I think everybody saw this, it would be a Disney-fied version of New Orleans 
the what's real and authentic about it would be displaced. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, the city has come back in a in a remarkable way. So the problems that it faces are not problems of failure, uh, but the problems it faces now are problems of success. Uh, there are aspects of the New Orleans. One thing I could say about New Orleans music culture, it doesn't start in clubs, it doesn't start in concert halls, it doesn't start in schools. It starts in the streets. You see seven, eight, well, uh, a, a quite well-known performer at this point in time uh, on the national scene, Trombone Shorty, uh, started out as a five-year-old kid marching in a brass band down the street with a tr hoisting a trombone that was bigger than him. Uh, the music starts in the streets. So right away, you have a clash between how the indigenous culture works and how certain kinds of folks want to live their lives. You know, there are people, even in New Orleans, who don't want to hear music in the street in front of their house every day. Um, we knew that we had a problem with success when the first newcomers came in in about 2007 and called the police when a, a jazz funeral was going by their street and saying, there's some noise in the street. And the cops came and busted musicians. And we realized, okay, this is now, how, 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 do, you, how do you deal with this? Um, I was just hearing this morning that Mardi Gras Indians, who are, are musicians who mask as Indians uh, and, and perform in the streets at a couple of occasions during the year, uh, and have done so for 150 years, it's indigenous culture writ large, are now being given grants to go to entrepreneurship training. And, uh, you know, we see the next step in this is something that's never happened in New Orleans. I mean, the, the Mardi Gras, to take one example, has never had commercial sponsorship. We see with these kinds of grants to Mardi Gras Indians to, to, to learn entrepreneurship, Budweiser presents the Mardi Gras Indians looming in our future. Um, we're fortunate in that the city has been able to maintain its cultural institutions without the benefit of outside commercial or inside commercial sponsorship. Commercial sponsorship doesn't play a part in this culture. That's pretty unique uh, as American culture goes. Um, how do you preserve that? How, you know, sources of money are sources of money. Uh, you let it in and pretty soon you have American politics. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So these are sort of some of the problems we're wrestling with now is uh, you don't want to patronize uh, culture bearers by saying, no, 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 don't take the money, stay poor. On the other hand, you have to recognize there are dangers in every source of, of funding, especially from institutions that have never had a track record in culture before. So these are the, some of the things that we're, we're dealing with right now. And some of it is, as I say, the sim as simple as how you deal with the tensions between neighbors who like a nice, quiet living environment and a culture that plays music in the streets. Um, there are, in every city in this country, people who move into urban areas and want it to have the, the peace and quiet of, of the suburbs. Right. And don't like the hustle and bustle of the city and want to try to outlaw it or, un, un, or zone it away. And we're dealing with that. Uh, can you deal with the, the cultural issues like this in the context New Orleans is just having a comprehensive zoning ordinance drawn? Can you deal with cultural behaviors in zoning? I think zoning is like a, a clumsy, you know, ham-handed way of trying to deal with cultural issues. Zoning tells you where you can build things and how big they can be, but it can't deal with behaviors that, you know, nor mm -hmm. can the cops. You know, the other way of trying to deal with it is you call the cops when there's musicians out front. Right. Uh, so we're trying just now to have, start having discussions about community-based ways of ameliorating these kinds of conflicts. I think when, uh, when you talk about government and the arts, there's an immediate sense of tension there yes. right away. Yes. Um, and I think one of the problems is that government doesn't understand, they can't quantify art. They understand money. Budweiser sponsors the Mardi Gras Indians is a, okay, we get that. We get that. That's a revenue stream. 
we're having similar tensions in Chicago, where uh, there was a study done by the University of Chicago, you know, no, not just a fly-by-night organization. I've heard of that. A few years ago, yeah. Which quantified how much uh, revenue was generated by the arts community in Chicago, and it was staggering. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, you know, they presented it to City Hall, but then City Hall's got to read it and pay attention to it, which they conveniently just said, well, thank, that's, thank you very much. We'll just slide that over well, here. Well, the, the irony in New Orleans is the mayor, the current mayor was, uh, in his previous career, the lieutenant governor, basically in charge of the cultural economy of the state of Louisiana. So he understands, Mitch Landrieu understands that concept of cultural economy, and they have quantified to a great extent in, in New Orleans what the cultural economy means to that city because aside from some uh, uh, movie making going on there, Cultural economy is the economy of New Orleans. <laughs> they, they get how serious it is. Right. Okay, um, last thing on that subject. In terms of this audience, what do you think people can, can do uh, in, in terms of helping the situation there? How can a, how can a citizen, uh, a, a tourist, somebody who comes to New Orleans help uh, you know, in, in regard to what's going on there locally? Well, you know, th th there's a, there's a, somebody from New Orleans was saying this earlier. Tourists come to New Orleans, he said, uh, and they want to see what where the lo they want to go where the locals go. I'm not sure that's true. I think a lot of tourists want to go there, you know, get as they say on Bourbon Street a big ass beer and throw some bees, <laughs> and they should have the right to do that. Um, but there there is, as in any city, in New York, Chicago, any anywhere else, there is this pretty strict dichotomy between the tourist culture and the indigenous culture. And I'd say if you go to New Orleans, if you go to New Orleans, go see the Mardi, no, that's Professor Long here said that. Um, I'd say check out the indigenous culture, check out where the tourists don't go because uh, it's an eye opener and an ear opener. It is interesting how they sort of herd you into, into one area. You've yeah. gotta be a little, and, and I've been told by people you know, at the hotels, oh, you don't wanna go there. That's where yeah. you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're right. That's, that's where it's happening. That's yeah, where I, I, I remember reading in, in like 2007 or 2008 an in-flight magazine that had a guide to New Orleans, and everything they did was within the confines of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel or the Windsor Court Hotel, because you don't want to go anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's right. all inside the hotel. Yeah, stay right here. Yeah, stay right here. Right here, you'll be fine. So uh, I want to want to switch gears here a little bit, and obviously uh, we're going to try to get get some questions in here at the end too. There's a lot of ground we have to cover in a short amount of time. We're going to try to get to some of the highlights. Uh, one of Harry's latest projects is um, a uh, a program called Nixon's the One. I don't know how many are, are familiar with this, but uh, hopefully we'll get a little more familiar with it. Um, multifaceted career, lots of things going on at uh, at the same time, multitasking. Um, so Richard Nixon resurrected, you know, here we have, why now, why Nixon, why this, why this uh, TV endeavor? Okay, very briefly, uh, Nixon obsessed me because uh, I grew up in Southern California and he was as uh, omnipresent as the sunshine but in a different color, uh, <laughs> a somewhat darker cloud. Um, and then the you know, so all through that career, and I was doing satire on radio as he was president and all that. And then, the, then we realized that these tapes exist, and now suddenly you can be a fly on the wall in the world's scariest Oval Office. And I used to go recreationally in, in Washington to uh, Arlington, Virginia. There was a warehouse on the outskirts, and you could go listen to the tapes. And that was just fun. And then um, I, be, I befriended Stanley Cutler, who is a historian, the primary historian of the tapes and the guy who fought, filed the lawsuit to make the tapes public in the first place. And when I saw Frost Nixon, I saw, I hadn't seen a lot of fictional Nixon, but I saw, um, so what I saw, he was becoming kind of the, the a, a, a stylized movie villain character, you kids get off the lawn kind of guy. And I thought they're missing this whole creepy, grotesque, bizarre, comical side of him. Unwittingly comical which is the best kind of comical. Um, and so I said to Stanley, let's do a show that where these conversations that we know about that are on the tapes, they have nothing to do with Watergate or politics or anything, just great character comedy given to us by Nixon's own uh, hubris in taping himself, uh, and shoot it as if he had hidden not just microphones in the Oval Office, but cameras. So it looks like 
found videotape you were never supposed to see. And we made it for British television, and now it's uh, just gone up on, on YouTube here. Fantastic stuff. Um, we've got a little clip so that you can get an idea of what we're talking about here. It's, uh, it's Harry as the uh, title character in the Oval Office with uh, the actor playing Henry Kissinger. I said, uh, in effect, uh, uh, it's so far as we're concerned, we're ready to trade, we're ready to exchange. Excellent. But in terms of recognition yeah. or the technical problems or these other problems, I ain't going to talk about it. I thought that was good. Now we're going to get a hell of a blast from the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times. They're going to say, why don't you say you're going to recognize Red China? Screw them. Don't you agree? They did not get you to this point on your China policy. You did more in two years than they ever. Well, this drives them nuts, Henry. It drives them nuts. That's what I think. But I, uh, it, it, uh, we, we, uh, you know, you never know. Uh, the questions determine it. Mm. Uh, but I thought we got some points across. Well, look, the questions were not good, but they were pretty stupid. But you, well, but when I talk about the young people, uh, I thought that was not bad. That uh, I dream with them and I want them to believe in the country. That wasn't bad. Well, uh, what did you think about the kid, the, uh, the answer about the family? Wasn't that good? Mm, I, that was excellent. It was valuable. Uh, I thought it wasn't bad. It wasn't the best. No, I thought it was. But, you know, the idea of uh, we're ending the war and we're doing this and we're proving that the system works. Now, kids, come aboard. Let's get going, huh? Let, let's focus on the things that we can do rather than on That's the, right. Then let's make this thing work. That's and right. I, I thought that this... Well, Henry, have a good time. <laughs> Thank you. I need, I need to, to clarify that the, that's absolutely word for word, pause for pause, hem for hem, haw for haw, uh, 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 absolutely word accurate and, and rhythm accurate as well. We rehearsed these scenes to get the, ab the crazy rhythms. I mean, uh, for people who just, it, it is apropos to the music world because uh, there are words and music in these scenes and sometimes they get the words right but they forget about the music and so in rehearsing we we, we were working on the rhythms and the and the intonations of these dialogues because they're just cr as crazy as the words are and this was at about 10:30 at night and Nixon had been drinking and so that was <laughs> the looser Nixon <laughs> you know and it, it's laugh out loud comedy but the thing that strikes me about this project and I think it's it's um, it's similar to a lot of the other stuff that you've done in this vein. It's, it's layered in a way. It's not just comedy. There's a darkness here, and there are parts of the series where I'm distinctly uncomfortable watching him. Well, yeah. You know, I, it makes me a little, like, queasy. Like, yeah. No, the, the idea was this is a, a ridiculously uncomfortable person to be around, uh, and it's, the show all takes place in the Oval Office, and it's, it was, you know, when people... The, executives that I was pitching it to said, how long do you want this show to be? How long a show do you want to do? I said, half an hour, it's so claustrophobic, you'll be fighting to get out of it, you know, <laughs> by that point. Because it is, that's it, an uncomfortable little world he created. Yeah, so making a series out of making people uncomfortable. Hey, it's a what living. A, what a career plan. It's huh? a living. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I, I want to draw this parallel because it's also the 30th anniversary of This Is Spinal Tap, and Derek Smalls is a, you know, which, which Harry created, you know, uh, with uh, three other gentlemen that are uh, also very creative people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wonderful piece of work. I want to I wanna ask you this one question. Um, there have been all sorts of uh, questions about how much, because you guys wrote it. But there was Quote. a question about, oh, you know, and Fran Drescher said once, oh, it's, it was a 30-page script. But what was, in fact, the script? Well, the script, we wrote it, we got writing credit, we actually went to the Writers Guild and said, we, can we give credit to the actors who improvised the dialogue in this movie? And they voted 15 to nothing against us uh, because they're the Writers Guild. Uh, um, but uh, the script was a scene-by-scene -scene description of what happens in each scene. It was as if 
we had written in a, a complete script, and the CIA came in and redacted all the dialogue. <laughs> so what you saw was the stage directions that indicated to the crew who have to show up and actually know what's going on, right. these characters are in this place doing this, and that's what the script was. Uh, but every line of the, the only, there were two lines that were written, uh, they were for the, uh, the guy who played Sir Dennis Eaton Hogg, the head of uh, Poly Polymer Records, and uh, <laughs> we wrote two lines for him to toast us, but everything else was improvised. Everything else was improvised, yeah. that's, that's amazing work. Um, what, what strikes me in, in watching the movie now, and again, it was one of those, you know, the first time you see it, it's laugh out loud, and I find myself getting pulled in by the underlying poignance now when I'm watching it, you know, 30 years later. Well, Similarly with Nixon. You yeah, know, I mean, I, I was going to draw the, the parallel between these two uh, 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 apparently uh, very uh, different worlds. Um, I, I believe in reality as the funniest shit around, you know. Uh, it's, it's our job as, as artists, I think, to observe and edit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> observe the funny stuff that's going on and edit the boring parts out. Um, and so everything in Spinal Tap was based on stuff that either Michael, Chris, uh, Rob, and I had gone through ourselves in various uh, bands or groups that we'd been in part, of, part of, or that friends of ours had been in. So, for example, the Air Force Base scene was the original keyboard player in Spinal Tap had to leave before we got the movie made. He went on the road with Uriah Heep. He comes back after a year, and we say, what was that like? And he tells us this story, and it's the Air Force Base story. And we say, that's in the movie. <laughs> the... Couldn't find the way to the stage. That was me in New York City. A friend of mine used to manage the Grateful Dead. He said, come to see us at Madison Square Garden. I go to Madison Square Garden. I'm walking all around trying to find the way to the stage. They have two stages in Madison Square Garden. I open the wrong door, and I'm watching a light heavyweight boxing match. <laughs> so, that's in the movie. That's in the movie. That's great. But uh, the other thing I was going to say is about the poignancy that you, you're, you're, you're mentioning. Uh, in both the characters in Tap and in this totally different character that used to be president of these godforsaken United States, um, one has a choice of playing them as uh, stick figures or cartoons or as the guy who was sort of my mentor when I was growing up because I was in show business as a kid and I worked for Jack Benny, uh, play the underlying humanity of these flawed people. And if you do that, you don't have to sympathize with them, you don't have to agree with them, you don't have to empathize with them, but you're playing them not as some foreign object, some alien monster kind of figure, you're playing them as us, just another one of us, a fucked up version of us, but one of us. Right. Um, it's interesting to me that you, you were able to create such a fully formed character. I mean, you're under I mean I've talked to bands since, I mean, I'm, Aerosmith is still convinced the movie's about them. <laughs> I, and I'm not kidding you. So is Liam Gallagher. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there are all these people. <laughs> Truer than you believe, right? I mean, it's just un unreal. But your, uh, your understanding of that culture, um, you know, as a music person yourself, um, it seemed like you went into this project with this sort of both, you know, let's laugh at it, but let's all, we also love it. We love yeah, it. Yeah, well... You know, the, the real impetus for doing the movie was not let's make a funny movie about rock and roll. We were funny guys, so we figured whatever we did was going to be somewhat funny. But the impetus was why do movies keep getting rock and roll wrong? Can't some, it's not that hard to do it right. So our original impetus was let's get this right for a change. When you see our fingers moving, let them actually be playing what you're hearing on the track basic little thing that most movies didn't do at that time. Yeah. You were going, well, he's not playing that. Um, and get the stories right, um, which is why I think, regardless of whatever we brought to the party in addition, not just rock and rollers, but country musicians and even classical musicians have come up to me and said, we take that, that movie on the, on the bus with us. Because mm -hmm. it's about the musical life, right. you know, whatever, costumes you wear and whatever hairstyle you have, it's about the life of a musician on the road. Um, true DIY artist too. I mean, you know, go back to Spinal Tap, N nobody wanted that. Nobody understood it. To Nick, you know, to Nixon now, like who, what, Nick, why Nixon, why now? Mm -hmm. You know, it, th there's a level of risk taking 
the, the road less traveled, you know, a total, you know, I'm going to, the, the culture's going this way, I'm going to go that way. Uh, and that seems to have been there from, from a pretty early stage. Where does that come from? I think a uh, couple places. One, my parents were both immigrants uh, from uh, Eastern Central Europe, so uh, I was set to the task of learning about the country while they were learning about the country. I was learning, you know, as a kid, they were learning as grown-ups. And secondly, I was uh, skipped ahead in school. So my peer group wasn't my peer group. <laughs> so I was really, I, I didn't have that period of time where I, I felt like I had to, you know, go with the crowd because they weren't my crowd. Um, so that really taught me to go my own path, you know, those two things. And then uh, I, I just couldn't get out of the habit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it, it's 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 a lonesome thing, sometimes, <laughs> but uh, you know, and and then my mom says from the age of five I was very stubborn, and that you know so it's just like I kept doing it. Uh, I, I believe wouldn't learn. Yeah, wouldn't learn yeah. my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I, obviously there's so many things we can talk about, but you know, uh, the the Simpsons. Uh, I, I don't know. Most of you probably know the multitude of voices that. What is it about twenty? Uh, uh, yeah, current count, yeah. Yeah, 20 characters on The Simpsons that uh, Harry has been voicing since the start of the program. And at, I was fascinated by these stories about 10 years ago um, where you, you called out the people on the show basically saying, hey, I, you know, I, don't, I don't feel the honesty here. I don't feel <laughs> these characters are, are going uh, where they should. I, it's like you, you were basically calling your boss out and saying, you know, your meal ticket, which is a very hard thing to do. We're in a room here with people that are faced with these giant corporations. Uh, they've all got a boss of some sort, I would imagine. It's very hard when they're paying you to, to, to call them out. And you were, you did that. Yeah, it wasn't voluntary. I, I, I was tricked into it or, or if, you know, I was, I, was, uh, I was answering questions from a reporter. Those damn reporters. <laughs> it's the damn media, just like Nixon says. Um, but... You know, I guess what's at the bottom of all that is, is not to be, uh, as I'm sometimes referred to around that show as the turd in the punch bowl, but, um, <laughs> but to have a sense of your own value. Uh, look, we, we creative people exist with this sort of birth problem. We are born loving to do uh, this stuff. And we would, truth be told, and sometimes we do, do it for free. That is the curse that we live under because the people who run these large companies know that about us and therefore uh, use that as leverage against us. And uh, I happen to have a possibly inflated view of my own value to uh, certain things like The Simpsons and just think, you know, um, I wouldn't do it now, but I did it then uh, uh, to, to say those kind of things publicly at least once. Um, uh, it, it didn't have any impact one way or the other, and, but it made some people mad and, and um, I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. Um, but I think there are times when you just have to uh, have belief in, in your own, in the value of what you're bringing to the table, you know. Uh, they do try very hard to, uh, I think, in my experience, uh, give you the sense that, uh, which is true to an extent, that there are people lined up around the block to take your job, and any one of them can do as well as you. That's the part I disagree with. Uh, for example, uh, when we f had our first contract negotiation at The Simpsons, the head of Fox, says to the New Yorker, I mean, talk about people calling each other out. The head of Fox says to the New Yorker, we can find people on any high school campus in the country to do these voices. <laughs> well, yes, you could. You, they might not be funny. They could do the voices, but they might not be funny people. Uh, my response was we could find uh, some, anybody on a, any high school campus in the country to run Fox, and we have. <laughs> Um, over and over again. Yeah. It's easy to say because, you know, standing on the sidelines, it's easy to say, oh, sell out. You know, they put the, they put the paycheck in front of the art. 
uh, you sort of flip that. It's hard to do, um, the, and consistently. Um, there's got to be a drive there uh, to do stuff that interests you, otherwise you, you're not having it. Um, oh, yeah. And again, that's not an easy lesson to learn, but I, I think especially when you're invested in the process for, you're not just a new guy, you know, but you've been in there in the game for a while, and you want it to continue. Yes. And still to be able to say that to somebody, you know, that takes a, a certain amount of cojones, you know? Uh, well, look, I, I, I will say this, and, and now uh, with the state that the earth is in, I think the earth is on my side. It's easier to do what you're talking about if you don't have kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you've got kids to feed and get through college, these become much more fraught choices. Yeah. Uh, but the earth would like you not to have any kids. <laughs> and, mm. it's, and it's it's easier to have, a, a, I mean, my wife and I both have careers in the arts, and it's just like, we've both been able to withstand uh, this process uh, of not being, as you say, where the, where the, the thing wants to go uh, and keeping to our own courses because of that. So, you know, it's a hard thing to say. And in another era of humankind, it might have been a cruel thing to say, but now there are really too many people on the planet, so stop mm -hmm. it. Another, another panel all together, I think, right? <laughs> um, everybody's like, wait, okay, let's go. Um, teenage Harry Shearer, the plan. There was no plan. You've done so many different, maybe there was, but yeah. you've done so many different type of creative, you've been a TV film, you know, the books you've written, mm. radio show, Le Show has been on for, that's another 30 year. Yes. Which is, I don't know if you've heard Le Show, but it doesn't really sound like anything else on public radio when it came out, and it still doesn't. Thank you. Um, Please give. But if you'd sort of mapped it out, even then would you have said, I'm going to do all, you know, 17 different things with my life? Here's uh, what I did uh, think about, because I'd been in show business as a child, working for Jack Benny and for other people for eight years, and then thought, thank you, that was nice, now I'm going to have a serious grown-up life. Tried that, uh, ran, ran screaming back into show business. Um, I decided I wanted to be in show business. That was a moment. I'd been out of it for uh, between the ages of 15 and 22 and came back, uh, no, 24. So nine years, I came back to show business. And I thought, okay, I'm doing this, but now I'm doing this for the rest of my life. I'm a lifer. Uh, I looked around and it, it occurred to me that I did not want to be someone who got great fame in their 20s, meteoric fame in their 20s, and by the time they're 42, they're sitting around saying, where'd the crowd go? I was, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, right. So I thought patience was a good thing to have. Hard thing to have in your 20s, hard thing to have when, you know, the desperation strikes of, holy crap, the, the, yeah. everybody's getting ahead of me. Uh, and the second thing was something my mom said, uh, which was, um, use all the talents you've got. And I put those together to create a strategy called be a moving target, because show business exists, both the music business and the television and movie business uh, exist to Find that thing that you do, uh, monetize that thing that you do, turn you into roadkill, find the younger person who does that thing you do, replace you with them, mm -hmm. and move on. Right. And so to, be, to, to say you're going to be a lifer is sort of nervy, but being a moving target, making it harder for them to say, oh, you're the guy that does, wait, now you're this, you know. It makes it harder to pigeonhole, it makes it harder for them to market you, so you are, it is, in the initial moment, possibly self-destructive. But if you can wait it out, I mean, when I was 35 years old, my taxable income was zero. Well, <laughs> things changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got microphones, I think, right? On either side? Um, microphones, so if any questions for Harry. Uh, that virtue of patience, please line up to the microphones if you want to <laughs> ask a question. We'll, uh, we'll be glad to take Look them Look how up. you did. Lucky, lucky. Segue. Yes, patience. Um, patience. Yeah. Let's, um, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, congratulate uh, Harry on, on, you know, 
there was there was stuff I, when I went to see a mighty wind. You know, I could tell. You know, some of, they they did heavily fictionalized and they changed, bent and warped a lot of the stories. But you could tell from the history of of folk music, sort of what some of the which characters some of the others were based on, and I mm -hmm. I, I found that very uh, interesting. I was saying, oh, they're the, these, they're they're that, mm -hmm. you know, but heavily warped and out of, out of you know, so when how about get, how, get sued. How about this for for wackiness, Christopher Guest's babysitter was Mary Travers. Oh my. <laughs> Yeah, so at, at, at any rate, I just, uh, you know, I, 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 I see, you know, your thing about gentrification and whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm, I run, helped to run a space out in Tacoma Park here in D.C., and we've got a rear neighbor that, like, just moved in, like, two years ago, and we've been running what people think of us as a club, but we're lo more of, like, a space that has loud music in it a lot, and we used to do a lot of punk, and now it's like, we've got to close at 10 because D.C. has this ridiculous noise ordinance, and... You know, so it's, well, it's that, horrible. That is, that is one of the things that New Orleans is dealing with. They, they tried to uh, have a, a sound ordinance and, uh, come before the city council last spring. I was part of the meetings involved in that. And uh, there are so many uh, lines of fissure that start being created around that subject. Uh, whether you call it noise, whether you call it sound, uh, in New Orleans, hard to believe in a city that's based its entire career on music, birthplace of jazz and uh, of, of a lot of funk, there are specific legal prohibitions about music. And uh, it has been brought to their attention that this is probably unconstitutional, music being a form of expression. Yeah, yeah. Un unfortunately, you know, it's like the, the woman in the back is just using it, the law as leverage against us. She doesn't want us there, period, but never mind. Yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, laws that are basically a, a, a directed at music as opposed yeah. to sound per se, which can be uh, groups of motorcyclists who periodically drive down my street in the French Quarter, uh, for the enjoyment of the sound that makes when they echo across the buildings. You can't single out music. Constitutionally, you can't single out music. Uh, and, and that's a, a problem that I think our, all of our cities are dealing with in one way or another. Do we have time for one more? Oh, my God. There we go. So uh, I, I heard a story which may or may not be true, but if it is true, I think it's a... Uh, well, I'll get to that question in a second. So the story is that you would open for Spinal Tap with uh, the Folksman. True. So essentially the same people yes. engaged in the same exact activity, different style of music, and the fans would boo you. This, this happened only once. Yeah. Okay. We, we, opened, we, we did this tour where we opened for ourselves. This is before Mighty Wind came out. <laughs> and we just thought, we'd, we'd originally done The Folksman on Saturday Night Live, uh, and the joke was that they were opening... For, uh, uh, no, we, we did the Folksman on Saturday Night Live. Then we did the joke that the Folksman were opening for Spinal Tap for a, a, a show that ran on NBC called The Return of Spinal Tap. So the idea that the Folksman would open for a rock band just seemed you know, ludicrous on its face. Worst possible opening act. So we did a little tour <laughs> playing that joke out. Played Carnegie Hall, or as Derek called it when he first got to the microphone, Carnegie fucking hole. Um, <laughs> Went fine, played the Greek theater, went fine. We got invited, we played the Hard Rock in Las Vegas, went fine. Came back to New York, because it was so successful, to the Beacon. And the Beacon didn't say opening act, or didn't mention that it was an opening act. So now we come out on stage as the Folksman, the joke on the worst opening act for a rock band, and nobody knows who we are, and nobody is expecting us. And they're going, and instead of doing the joke on the humiliation of being the, the wrong opening act, we are experiencing the actual experience of being the wrong opening act because we can't break character and say, no, 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 we're the guys you like, come on. So the sweat is pouring down us and, and now we have to come back and entertain these fucks, you know? Yeah, because, uh, I will say one other thing about that. I thought we were the only people ever to be that stupid or clever to, well, you know, yeah. there's a very fine line, as you know, uh, to open for ourselves. Uh, how many of you remember in the late 1970s a, a hit 
that uh, was riding on the citizens band radio craze of the moment called Convoy by C.W. McCall. Okay, so he's that guy. Now, uh, in the mid-1980s, there was a series of, of prog rock Christmas albums that started coming out. Mannheim Steamroller, same guy. And he, C.W. McCall came out and did a concert tour we opened and was followed on the stage by Mannheim Steamroller. It was the same guy, so we share the honor with him. Oh, Thanks, Harry, oh. that was great. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.